Hello, hello, and welcome to Open Source episode 29. I'm delighted to, to welcome to the show Akbar Datu. Say hi, Akbar. Hi, everyone. Hi. And uh, back on the show, as usual, we've got Rory. You want to say hi? Hi, everyone. <laughs> and Mark, do you want to say hi? <laughs> hey, everybody. Right. Akbar, do you want to tell us a little bit about yourself and also why have you chosen to, to join our community? Sure. So uh, Akbadatu started off life as a technologist, uh, a couple of years of working um, within technology and saw the light and became a lawyer, as you do. Um, but now, thankfully, somewhere in the middle and the founder of a legal technology, legal change consultancy called D2 Legal Technology, helping firms digitize agreements and legal opinions, etc. Um, and why did I join InsureBlox? Well, actually, a dream to join this, right? I mean, <laughs> um, but on a serious note, um, great conversation, great insights that you can find from people and uh, great community. Brilliant, brilliant. Well, it's, it's awesome to have you uh, with us, Akbar. So um, as you got the mic, can you actually kick it off and tell us what is it in your news that you found interesting this week? So I'm going to go with something that uh, has been quite dear to, 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 to my heart um, and big shout out to the Financial Times for um, doing well, uh, giving us an award for a new utility that we've um, just come up with called the LEI Identification Utility, um, really to help institutions manage complex legal advice that they might get. Um, we have been looking at things such as close out netting opinions that um, the England and Wales one, that's probably the more straightforward of them, runs to about 282 pages of complex legalese. And essentially institutions need to take that and transform it into a simple yes or no. Now that cannot be sensible. Um, there must be a smarter way of doing it, presenting it in a way that is more automatable. So what we've done is we've launched a utility where um, firms can type in some basic details. And in order to assess scope as to whether a particular fact pattern applies and a particular counterparty is covered by the opinion, they simply type in an LEI and there you go. We, we, we do the work um, for you. And essentially it's done once because you've got lots of institutions trying to cover the same background check today, which is just crazy, right? We all need to check the same things. So why not run it as a utility? So big shout out to the FT, the Intelligent Business Awards and featuring our LEI utility this week. Congratulations for that award and for being featured in the FT. So that's, that's awesome, Akbar. Um, thank you for that. Rory, could you tell us what is it in your news that made you that you found interesting? Well, it's um, let's say it's a, a con condensation of an experience I had recently. It's more than something being in the news, but um, it's around my Simplify contract negotiation app. And it's not that I'm going to like the application itself. I just want to share what I enjoyed learned so far in the experience of creating a company around that uh, application and launching it. So. Um, uh, two or three things I'd say, right? Um, which were a bit of a surprise to me. First is uh, partners are absolutely key and um, you don't always know them when you start your journey, right? My project attracted someone I didn't know before who just called up one day interested in in actually the, the podcast that you and I did, uh, Walid, um, around smart contracts. And he said he wanted to work with me. And so Excellent. it's worked and we're, gr we're great friends and business partners now and we shared an enthusiasm and it went from there. Fantastic. It's really nice. And then um, the second thing I noticed is that unless, you're, unless your product and your concept is pure IP, so it's really research-based and it's you know, brand new and uh, you really want to protect it, feel free to talk about your idea to whoever you want, basically. No one's interested to steal your IP. You know, this is my finding. I, I was terribly protective over all this stuff at the beginning, but I found that you don't have to be. Yeah. Um, no one will copy you by the time you get it out. So um, anyway, that's the, the second thing. The third is that uh, people are always open to support and your network is super powerful. Everyone's gonna give you half an hour, except for you, Walid. You're gonna give everyone a day, right? <laughs> <laughs> and the final one for me is um, patience is key and I'm not a patient person and that was really hard. So that, that's my kind of, like of the like of the week uh, is a little bit my own findings. You know, when you s sit at the top of the hill of what you've created and you survey all the decision points, all the features, your website, your team, and you think I did something. You know, and that feeling is my like. 
and I want to again and again. And um, I, anybody reach out to me with new ideas, uh, particularly my current partners who I love. And you guys are good. Brilliant, Anna. Thank you. That's some very good, very good insights. And you know, as you know, I've built you know a few stars myself. And that second point regarding, you know, not wanting to talk about it, you know, the risk, you know, of your IP being stolen. My, my view on that is, as long as you constantly engage with your customer, you know, on a regular basis to ensure that your product is a perfect fit for what they need, and you run like the wind, it doesn't matter if someone copies you. <laughs> Right? They're not going to be able to catch up and they're not going to be able to have that intimate relationship that you have established as a customer, thus enabling you to have the perfect product for them. But, um, and, yeah, exactly. The feedback loop and, and out of which you develop the perfect product. It's, it's, it rarely looks like your idea at the beginning. Yes, it very rapidly transforms. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Mike, do you want to tell us what is it in news that you found interesting this week? I will do. And, and even though Rory was too modest to say it, it, and again, some of the, the key entrepreneurial characteristics about reflection and humility, but I've been using the Simplifier platform for about nine months and, and I really like it. I've, I've been using it for my NDAs and it's fantastic. Oh, nice. So, yeah, you, you can take that as an official feedback. Um, Thank you, but, but my topic is around um, the launch by the Digital Assets Bank, uh, Signum, uh, yesterday um, on a new source of funding for small companies where they can create and trade shares that is enabled by blockchain um, and and it's really seen as something that may challenge stock exchange dominance so they've they've got a token issuance service called designate um, and it's actually uh, their virtual um, what they call their dchf currency and it's backed by the swiss franc as well so it's it's going to be used for instant payments on trades and, and, and again, they've already got off to a good, you know, a good start. They've got a sizable Italian asset management group called Azimut. They've got Japanese venture capital, SBI. They've also got a Swiss electric car manufacturer, BAK Motors. So they're going to raise money on the fund and, and it continues to grow. There's a lot of stuff on that. And, and particularly because I think they're, they're looking to challenge how much financial in intermediaries charge for actually raising uh, debt. Uh, and again, the Swiss the Swiss government's been kind of really supportive of all of this. Um, Swiss lawmakers and Rory will know far more about this than me. They they recently passed um, quite an upgrade to their financial and corporate laws, so that blockchain and the digital assets were included. And around the world, we're kind of seeing a race at the moment. So Singapore is planning a digital assets trading platform. Um, you know, there's lots of other token shares that are looking to come along from people like Like, and um, we've seen it from Brickmark um, and, and a lot going on. So for me, it's a great example of the maturing pace, more maturing pace of blockchain DLT digital assets. And they're becoming, you know, into some of the real kind of bastions of traditionalism and, and it's almost accepted as and trusted. So I think it's a great, a great move. Great, great. No, thank you very much for sharing that. Um, Akbar, do you want to tell us what is it in the news that made you wonder? What made me wonder? Well, um, I saw something relating to LIBOR repapering and, and remediation and a particular company's uh, efforts to try and use or jump to using AI in order to solve its problems that, that, that really did make me wonder. Um, maybe if I just give it a background to, to, to you know, what the problem was. So LIBOR, London Interbank Oxford Rate, um, sometimes referred to as the world's most important number. You know, it underpin trillions of dollars of transactions. It's a key interest rate benchmark, mortgages, loans, derivatives, bonds, and just contracts, right? I mean, you know, any, any sort of buy, sell, insurance policy, et cetera, may have a reference to this rate that is a default rate or, or something else. Uh, and what's happened in the industry is since 2012, it's emerged that, um, you know, banks were essentially misstating their LIBOR rate submissions and often in collusion and in order to try and make better returns. So essentially, a whole load of traders went to prison. There was a massive, you know, $10 billion of regulatory fines. And basically, the regulators said enough is enough. This is susceptible to being manipulated and there will not be LIBOR rates. Um, by the end of uh, 2021. So we're kind of moving to other rates. But, you know, it's not particularly straightforward because you've got so many contracts in all different walks of life 
having these contracts in, uh, these this rate um, in there hardwired in. So there's a real need with quite some urgency to find the contracts that reference this rate and then figure out what you're going to change it with, which, which is a, not a trivial answer, but nonetheless, you need to find it first. So there was this story of an institution that decided to jump to um, using an AI tool in order to find uh, different references, spent a lot of money configuring it, et cetera, et cetera. And it just didn't work because of this idea that you could just hand it over to the machines. Um, essentially, firstly, they didn't find the documents to then put into the machine properly. They were like related contracts. Um, I, I know, I mean, would seem like the most important step. Maybe it's because it's a bit dull, that kind of manual having to put through drawers, et cetera. But, but ultimately, there's some things in life you're just not going to change. And then the other thing was um, the, the digitization, the, the converting into machine readable text. Ultimately, it needed the word to be converted into L-I-B-O-R. Well, unfortunately, the machine converted some of those into L-1-B-O-R. Uh, and let's just say it didn't return the results it needed. And it reminded me of, a, there's a lovely quote from uh, Kasparov when he lost uh, to Deep Blue many, many years ago, where he said, the emphasis is not about who wins. It's not man versus machine. Really what we're looking for is the optimum solution. And that surely has to be man plus machine. But maybe he just lost, right? <laughs> Excellent. Very good. Thank you for that, Akbar. Uh, Rory, uh, do you want to tell us what is it in you that made you wonder? So what made me wonder this week was Apple Glasses. And obviously the Google version read its head and then disappeared again. Now Apple are all over this with their smart glasses coming out in 2022, 2023, something like that. And I... I can't do without my glasses anymore and um and so imagine if apple were looking at everything i am looking at too of course there are benefits so i have a horrible sense of direction and i could just have you know directions in the corner of my eye instead of having to walk around and be in that position you know um but um which which looks very idiotic but um you know i wonder what the future will be like for me when my reality is digital by default basically and what happens to things like i don't know exams or, or television or whatever and what happens to insurance when all the evidence of exactly who you are and what you do is all there all the time i mean in a way it's an ideal situation isn't it but anyway when it comes out i think of um i think i might buy a second pair but i'm definitely keeping these two <laughs> it's, it's going to be an interesting one because you know apple traditionally is not considered an innovator, right? They usually follow what other people have done, but just do it a lot better and integrate it tightly within the ecosystem. And I think this is a tricky one. And I'm kind of surprised actually they're gonna go into this space because Google Lens failed. Uh, Snapchat had their own Google, uh, own um, glasses, which also fundamentally failed. Um, Cause you know, there is this mixture of functionality and usability and also is it's on your face, you know, it's a, mm. it's a statement. Is this something you're happy to wear? Um, I don't know. It's going to be an interesting one to, to see, but yeah, in theory, the usability of it for both the mass consumer market, but also, you know, for within the professional space, whether it's, you know, our engineers and, and, and another specialist, there's definitely use for it, but um, I don't know. I'm, I'm not too convinced um, that they're actually going to do it. I mean, I think they've been playing around with it, but because again, they're not traditionally, um, they're, they only follow when something has been quite established. Well, well, what I've noticed is that the, you know, th that whole machinery, the Apple machinery is sort of, they're no longer being that secretive about it and they're built, banging a drum somehow. And um, when they do, I, I sort of trust their record delivery on the whole. Hmm. And so, um, and so, yeah, it's counterintuitive, but I'm, I'm just wondering. Yeah, no, of course, of course. Hmm. Mark. What is it in the news that made you wonder this week? Uh, we, on the Google, is it contact lenses now? <laughs> well, we don't script these and we, and we never talk about what we're going to talk about before we talk about it. So it's always interesting, but, <laughs> but mine is slightly eye related. So um, in this age of digital and, and definitely in insurance, we're constantly talking about empathy. So we talk about the, the importance of empathy in the same way that we're obsessed with um, transformation and innovation but I wonder how much we really understand about it and how much we think about it and, and what it means and, and in particular uh, and we're all now you know using uh, web conferences more than ever but actually how this can work how we can get empathy in a digital space so how can we read the virtual room 
So um, the Koreans uh, have a term called nunchi for eye measurement. Um, and it's the act of figuring out what your counterpart thinks or feels in certain situations and acts accordingly, at which point everybody starts to look around, look away and, and avoid eye contact <laughs> and start thinking about this from a card point of view. But it, it's actually um, really interesting in terms of can we work upon um, our empathy uh, around that when a lot of our cues uh, are restricted. So I'm a behavioral modeler, you know, one of the things I do. So the inability to look at things below the head level or below waist level is a problem you know you, you often there'll be other tells there's a lot of stuff that we model around linguistics in terms of um use of words pitch pace tonality etc but a number of other things that we can still get and, it, and it's not new so for example um the fbi amongst other people have been have been trained um by people like um David uh, Matsumoto from a company called Humantel um, on, on the topic of micro expressions. So they are literally fleeting expressions that last less than a second. But um, there, you know, there are ways that you can even pick up on the seven basic emotions. So things like happiness, surprise, sadness, anger, fear, disgust. Um, and you can spot that as well as other things. You know, so if the nose wrinkles, um, and me from a multiple intelligence point of view, if somebody says, they turn their nose up at something um, or they use scattertorial language, their gut brain speaking. It's another way of, of building that empathy. And then we've got so many different forms of empathy. So we've got, you know, cognitive empathy. Um, so can we put ourselves in somebody else's shoes, which is really difficult because we usually don't take our own shoes off first. So our own <laughs> ego is there. So they don't always uh, fit. And even active listening, you know, people talk about it and, and I'll put some, some um, notes uh, out on, on active listening, but how that works. But it, again, a great example to help even your active listening. There was a piece of research in the Netherlands in 2013 that showed that people that read fiction, um, in particular science fiction, were more empathetic over, over time. Um, you know, it actually could be any form of fiction, but the ability to escape and put yourself in another's shoes, another's shoes. And also people that act even amateur dramatics can improve your empathy. And as I said, in, at this time and, and in the insurance industry, I think we, we lack empathy with our customers um, far too much. So it's made me wonder about where's empathy gonna go now? Excellent, excellent. And I'm so happy to hear that all those Star Wars and Isaac Asimov novels I read were not for our waste. <laughs> they were great. They were, they were great investments. You know, so many things as children get beaten out of us in the diseducation system. So a four year old has got world class imagination. By yes. the time they get to 14, it's average. By the time they leave school, it's gone. So all the people out here you know, that tune into our communities, the dreamers, the wishers, that's that's your imagination. So keep feeding it. Yeah, discover that child. I really need to read more science fiction. <laughs> <laughs> Chronic. <laughs> How about yourself, Agbar? Are you a sci-fi man? <laughs> I am, and I, I'm picking up the uh, Foundation series from Asimov that I read a long time ago. And I tell you, what's thrilling me is actually just, I mean, you know, the, the time he wrote that in yeah. the forties, fifties, and the fact that I'm still it still makes sense it's incredible it's amazing it's one of my favorite series by far so so yeah I, actually i might follow you and uh, reread them again also <laughs> well it's, it's coming out on tv next year right so that's a bit of a oh wow uh, I didn't uh, realize. excellent yeah. do it i revisited william gibson um again from from my childhood cyberpunk and, and all the phrases we, we <laughs> take as normal it's great and and it's still you look at it and say why the number of things you wrote around which were are now our reality or the things that are coming you know those are our dreamers indeed indeed well on this uh, happy dreamlike note um we're going to bring this episode to an end if you would like to join us and dream away please don't hesitate to uh, reach out to us or add a comment below we'd love to have you on our show um but for now we're going to wish you a wonderful rest of your day or evening and we look forward to catching up with you next week bye bye everyone Take care now.